Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming to this, this afternoon to this event. My name is Joe Stevens, and I'm the director of the Crosby MBA program here at the True Last School of Business, College of Business. Thank you for joining us today for another distinguished alumni lecture. Once again, we're grateful to be welcome to welcome a successful and distinguished MU alumnus to present a talk as part of the college's speaker series. One of the strategic priorities for the True Last College of Business is to encourage, arrange, and support collaboration among executives, entrepreneurs, and scholars. This type of interaction helps students and faculty members learn about trends, issues, and practices in the business world. Conversely, collaboration that occurs here in Cor Cornell Hall also exposes business people to what's being taught and studied around campus. The distinguished alumni lecture is integral to our college's collaborative initiative. We are very proud of the prestigious list of business people who have presented this lecture since its inception. Past speakers include, last week in fact, Bill Zollers, Chairman, President, and CEO of YRC Worldwide, and Matt Rose, Chairman and CEO of Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Through our speaker series this semester, we have gained insight and perspective about a variety of industries, transportation, investment management, manufacturing, and a few others. However, in the last few years, we have not had the benefit of someone talking about management in the communications industry, but that's about to change. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to remind everyone, uh, make sure that your cell phones are turned off, and I'll, uh, I'll do the same move that Dean Walker always does, and uh, make sure mine's off. And it wasn't, so that's good to, uh, to make sure that I take care of that. Please stay until the completion of the program, which will include a Q&A session following our speaker's presentation. We are scheduled to be finished by 4.45, and uh, I'll make sure that we, that we get that done. So I'll, I'll, watch, I'll, I'll keep my eyes on the watch today, and you guys just pay attention. Uh, he's got some great, some great things to, to share today. Today we're very fortunate to welcome the lead consultant of Australia's Telstra Corporation. Mr. Tom Lamming has been leading Telstra's IT and corresponding business transformation program since August of 2005. He is also active on several boards and senior advisory committee, committees. Recently, Mr. Lamming has been recognized for his outstanding work in a number of ways. In 2007, Australia Financial Review, which is the equivalent to the Wall Street Journal, uh, recognized him as one of Australia's most influential technology leaders. In, in August of this year, Symantec presented Mr. Lamming with their prestigious Innovator Award. And in September, just last month, he received Oracle's Asia-Pacific CIO of the Year Award. He previously worked at Accenture from 1978 to the fall of 2003, being admitted to the partnership in 1989. Tom has worked on in a variety of industries over the course of his 25-plus year at Accenture, concentrating the last 14 years in the communications industry. He specialized in working with primarily Fortune 500 organizations in the planning, designing, and implementation of integrated business solutions, organization performance, and information technology. Tom has held a variety of senior leadership positions, including global managing partner within multiple divisions at Accenture. In these capacities, Tom had responsibility for industry service line strategies, growth initiatives with clients and in key markets, and strategic investments and alliances. Tom is also a member of, was also a member of Accenture's Global Leadership Council and a representative to Accenture's World Economic Forum team. He retired there at the end of his uh, career at Accenture in 2003 and uh, spent some time with his family, and I'm sure he might be able to share just a little bit about how he landed at Telstra, as he did earlier today. Tom earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees here at the University of Missouri, so welcome home. And uh, b more biographical in information is, is in your, uh, your uh, program, and Mr. La Lamming has had a busy afternoon already, so we're, we're very appreciative of his time. He hosted an executive luncheon and a small group discussion with MBA students earlier. Following the talk today, we will have time for Q&A. And uh, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce Mr. Tom Lamming to pre present today's distinguished alumni lecture 
titled Managing Change in a Complex Business. Mr. Lamy. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. It's uh, good to be back here today. And uh, while I, uh, with Anderson Consulting, I had the opportunity in the 80s and 90s to heavily recruit out of Mizzou, in addition to Rala, Washu, St. Louis U. But it was always good to come back to Mizzou because it's coming home. Uh, a lot of my family went to school here. Uh, three of us out of the four kids went here. And uh, out of my wife's family, eight out of the eight went here. And uh, some of our nieces and nephews go here as well. So it's always good to be back. It's also good to see you, Dr. West. Um, you know, I, we, I attended your finance class in uh, graduate school. And uh, the things I've reflected on in all sincerity in my career, yours are one of the things in terms of the classes, of the life lessons that you gave in there as well, uh, that I reflected a lot on my career and were certainly important to me as I went along. So thank you. I want to publicly thank you. It's good to see you. I, uh, I'm going to share with you uh, uh, an amalgamation, really, of my career at Accenture and how I've applied that to a, a significant business problem down at Telstra. And so as we go through this, while we're talking about an Australian-based company, these are a lot of what I've applied 30-plus years of experience on in terms of a, a very complex set of problems and a complex integrated set of problems that we had to deal with down in Australia. So I wanted to give that flavor to you as, uh, as part of this discussion. Uh, I'm going to leave the majority of the time that we have here for question and answer as you wish, so I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes. Yeah, so as you have questions, please write them down, and I'll be glad to do those. Or if you want to stop me during the presentation, you're welcome to do that as too, and I'll hopefully recognize you as we go through. You may not know who Telstra is, uh, but tel in, outside of the United States, most of the communications companies were government-owned entities in Europe, Latin America, uh, Africa, a Asia, as well as uh, Australia. The government owned the phone company and owned other industries like some of the banks and that kind of thing. And what many of these um, countries did in the 90s through the early 2000s is did what they call privatize the companies. They began to sell them off, create shares, and sell the companies out on the, uh, on the stock exchanges. Uh, Telstra went through that in, I think it was 1993, where the government sold off its first tranche. Uh, in early 2000, it sold off its second tranche, but it still had 50% of the company to sell off in a public offering. Um, and uh, so we were brought down in, in uh, July, August of 2005 to make sure that as an American team we could come down, make sure the company was presentable and could go through and, uh, and be sold out on the global markets because there wasn't enough capacity or cash within Australia to be able to sell the remaining tranche off. So that was tranche three that we needed to do, which we did uh, last year. And that was our core mission of what we did. Um, I'll go through what we found that we needed to fix uh, prior to us being able to represent that on the global markets uh, to be able to do, and that was really the assignment uh, that we came through to do. Uh, it started with uh, the former CEO of uh, U.S. West, Saul Trujillo, who is also the CEO of Orange, which is a mobile operator, global mobile operator, uh, operated out of London and Paris. Uh, Saul was there as well as some other things. He came down to run Australia and he brought a number of us down there to help him work on this particular effort. The numbers that, uh, the business side there on the left hand side, it's predominantly an Australian based company, although we have operations in Asia as well as international, New Zealand, uh, but somewhere 95 plus percent of our revenues are generated out of Australia, so it's predominantly central there. We have a variety of businesses there. We have a uh, the landline business that you would associate with your local phone company. We have a long distance business that you would associate with your long distance company, although those are somewhat merged today. We have a mobile company that you would associate with your mobile uh, phone operator. We have an internet services based one that you would associate with an AOL or those kinds of things. We also have an online as well as a direct republishing which you would associate with online advertising and search and those kinds of things that we have all as part of those companies that are represented around there. We have 50% uh, ownership in Foxtel, which would be analogous to your uh, cable TV operators in terms of what we have as part of our business suite that we, we run and operate uh, within uh, Australia. Oops, now I gotta do this one back here. Sorry. 
You want to get it back for me? Well, whatever, or one ahead. Um, our uh, operations we uh, completed, we're on a European calendar. We uh, just closed out the year at $24.7 billion in terms of Australian dollars. That's about 80 cents on the dollar here, so roughly 20, million, 20 billion U.S. dollars that we generated um, in, in Australia. What's different between a Telstra and a Verizon and an AT&T, just to give you um, from an operating point of view, if you look at AT&T, they've got a fixed line business, they've got a long distance business, they've got a mobile business. And the only place where those come together on a P&L basis is at the CEO level, Randall Stevenson. Verizon, their wireless business is co-owned with Vodafone. Likewise, they've got a long distance business and they've got a landline business. And what happens is, is that each business unit makes their own decisions. While they try to bundle services to bring to you, uh, they uh, don't make their investment decisions as an integrated business. They'll invest in their wireless, they'll invest in their long distance, they'll invest in their local business. And we go through, because we, we are integrated in terms of our investment side and our uh, P&L side, we make common investments in terms of all those areas that I just referenced. And the benefit of that is, is that we march out the technology, because telecommunications is a technology business. You know, while you think about it in terms of just voice or data service, it is a technology business, a very complex technology business. And the idea behind that is, is that in any network, it'll choke up at its least point of, where it's got the least amount of capacity. And so if you don't have enough long distance capacity, but a lot of local capacity, you're, you're throttled in terms of what you can do in terms of downloading video or downloading any kinds of uh, uh, mail or, or files that you want to move around based on the long distance capacity within it. It's just about pipes. And so our core business is about bringing those things together and uh, doing it in, in a very cohesive way. Our performance that you would have seen on the other slide is, uh, shows how we compare and benchmark. We were going from a lagger in the industry three years ago that we are now from investment capital, the standard setting within the industry. So as you go through Bell Canada, where they went out and did a leverage buyout and, and are cleaning up the business, our metrics are now the standard in terms of what those investment companies are looking at to define their performance of service and the degree of integration that they want to get to. It's an amazing turnaround story in just three years. We have the best global network in the world. Uh, we are able to do this, and this is represented on this slide. We're a network-based company. And, uh, you know, at the very simplest form, a telecommunications company, you know, provides voice and, di and, and data tone service to you. That's all it does. You know, it can do it around a variety of mechanisms uh, and how it manages it, but that's fundamentally what we do. I like to think we deal with a fundamentally good service because there's nothing inherently bad in telephone service in terms of it's not like a tobacco industry where there's some harmful effects in terms of what it is. We provide an inherently good service. On the wireline, the Next-G network that we have is the industry-leading standard in the world. For those of you that are technology-based, um, we do 14.4 megabit download service, uh, 1.9 megabit upload service. We're going to 21 megabit service on a download at the end of the calendar year. That's faster than any uh, home landline service you have over cable or wireline, or that we serve in Australia that we have today and be able to uh, deliver over a wireless network. And that's end-to-end, -end, point to point, including the long distance. So from Sydney to Melbourne, it's got to go over a long distance network. We're able to deliver that kind of speed over, uh, over our network on a wireless basis. We can stream video. Uh, I can watch my Foxtel home ser service, if I'm so inclined, on my mobile phone. Uh, and streams, and I can call my wife or call somebody in the U.S. that happens to be watching that CNN program, and we're watching the same thing at exactly the same time. It's that quick, that fast, has, has uh, no latency in terms of what the network is. It's an astounding set of technology in terms of what we're able to do. It's backed up by one of the fastest IP-based networks in the world as well, which is our um, MPLS core that we're allowed to do that connects all those services together landline as well as wireless within Australia to deliver high-speed data network. Um, and it really matters on things where you're dealing with uh, content-based services. On the left-hand side, we've got a variety of means in terms of what, how we deliver and sell it. In the lower left-hand corner, we've gone in with a uh, new formatted store that really looks, if you've been in the Apple stores, 
in terms of what some of those stores look like. We've reformatted our stores uh, to uh, promote that. We call it the Tea Life Store, but it's really built after a lot of the Apple concepts in terms of the service desk, displays the technology that we have across all the products and services that we offer, and they're really pretty neat stores to go into. Uh, there's a lot of green kinds of things there where we're able to do it in terms of the lease space that we have. All the, uh, all the stations and, and fixtures that we have are all out of uh, reformed re, uh, product. And so we've gone in with a very good, strong green uh, focus on it. On the uh, business side, we also have customer experience centers that we've developed in Melbourne and Sydney. And, uh, and for that is as a business, as a small business owner, operator, or as a, a large business or government entity, you can come in and you can demo applications there that use our network. So we've got wireless credit card services, we've got wireless video cameras that if there's an accident in the middle of Australia, you can beam up the accident. And news companies are now using it. To, it's cheaper than their satellite service where they can go through with their next G phone and they can videotape interviews or, or an accident or a scene on the uh, deal, transmit it over our network and get it into the station very, very quickly. There's, there's a little reformatting and storage that they need to do. But they get to demo those kinds of applications in our lab setting so they can see how it's used as a product and service there. But fundamentally, it's not a lot different than what you would see other than the degree of integration that we have. So what did we... Uh, uh, the topic here is really about uh, change in terms of what we needed to do based on what we found. Uh, one statistic I'll give you, which was a surprise to me when I started out my career, somewhere in around the late 80s, I became aware of how many companies fail in a decade. You take the top 10 companies in the U.S., that are on the, on the big board or on the Fortune 100 list, the top 10, and you go into 1999, and six out of 10 of those companies would not be there anymore on the top 10 list. On the Australian list of a comparable, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, six out of 10 of those companies out of the top 100 companies in Australia don't exist anymore. They've either been gone out of business, they've become irrelevant, or they've been absorbed by another company. And the, and the product of this is that we need to be cognizant that as we go out there, the companies that we're going with, the companies that we're looking at, dramatic change is happening to them. Google didn't exist 10 years ago, okay? Enron's out of business. Some of you have done a case study out of Enron. It's out of business. A number of the large uh, communication players, AT&T was a dominant player until voice over IP hit and voice calls over a long distant network went to zero because you can do them for free. They went from a market cap of over 100 billion down to 16 billion at the point at Southwestern Bell bought them. And it was a function of a fundamental shift in the industry that they didn't recognize and deal with. And so the Darwin theory there is really very much part of the reality in which we live and have been living for a long time. And we need to understand that, you know, in terms of as you folks go out into the business community and become business leaders, that is part of the reality of the business world today. Here's our uh, game plan in terms of what we did. When Saul came down, we did a base mark of the benchmark of the company from July through mid-October, and we baselined every single process, every bit of the organization that was there. We looked at the people factors, we looked at the service metrics, we looked at the financial metrics, organization by organization. We also looked at the, what was happening to us in terms of the consumer market. Now, you may not realize that in a communication industry, they're heavily re regulated. Not only in terms of the, pr there's price setting that are defined by the government, the regulatory bodies there that define what service that we can provide, at what price point we can sell it externally, and what price point we can sell it internally, I I'm sorry, to other wholesales or reproviders. So some of you may buy DSL from somebody other than AT&T, uh, or United Telecom, um, I think they're called uh, Embark or something like that today. Um, you can buy that service from a reseller. It's using the same lines that AT&T or, or somebody else had uh, that served this area. I guess it was old Continental Telephone that served GTE, uh, served this area years ago. So you're just reusing their lines, reselling it. And those prices are set by the government in terms of what can be done. That's part of the regulation that we have to live with in terms of uh, the regulatory bodies that we have to serve. So we were going through here looking at all the regulatory, legal factors, as well as the competitive factors that we're dealing with, 
and what the company was baselined as. And we came up with an 18-point integrated program of change that needed to be done. That's represented by the uh, map of Australia there on the left side. Each square is one of the 18 programs that has a three to five year delivery program that has deliverables within it. We have it around what we're doing with strategic marketing, doing with customer segmentation, dealing with primary research that's going on in those areas. We're dealing with the cultural aspects of the company, what's good, what's not good, what do we need to do from the people side base there. We also dealt with uh, factors like what was going on with the network, uh, what upgrades and changes we needed to do there, as well as what we needed to bring about in terms of the supporting and enabling IT systems. And I know when, when I studied in school, there was not a lot of emphasis put on in terms of the IT aspects. IT was still a very uh, infantile kind of uh, setting in terms of what business did with, in, with software. And, and uh, as part of it, it was used for payroll. It was used for maybe general ledger and some things like that. But we were beginning to get into really an explosion of what we, how we were going to use IT to enable and support our basic business processes. These are huge parts of most every major corporation I know. I don't know a single corporation that's in the Fortune 500 that I can think of that doesn't have a huge IT base and systems there. And they're an important part of running our day-to-day -day operations, from running call centers, from running the technicians that come out to your home to install or serve you when you have a failure there, to running passenger airline reservation system, whatever they are, there's benefits in terms of what that technology. I happen to run the technology portion of this, and I work with uh, the business units, uh, which is about three quarters of Telstra. Uh, Telstra's got about 45,000 employees. Uh, three quarters of the employees that are, uh, of Telstra are affected by the business change that I'm putting in. So I'm going to look at all the business processes and the training and the people impacts uh, that, of the work that we're doing in terms of delivering that change of all our IT systems. We set up a set of factory principles, and uh, IT is a factory, in terms of what we're going to do as part of those changes. Do it once, do it right, do it in an integrated way, do it right for the customer. And everything that we have in terms of the roadmap that we put in place was, was a focus on the customer. On the right-hand side, there's about seven line items that are listed there. We did a study in the uh, early 90s of looking at all transformational change programs. And uh, what we found is that somewhere in the area, about eight out of every 10, 80% of change programs fail. It's not a lot different on merger and acquisition work, by the way. About eight out of, you know, four out of every five, eight out of every 10 M&A programs fail. But we found what are the common themes of those that are successful? What, what works in terms of all the successful programs of change? And those are listed on the right-hand side. The first one is, is to have active and engaged CEO leadership. The, the folks that, on any major change program, the person at the top that's running the organization needs to be actively engaged on a regular basis in terms of driving the decisions and the output uh, of that change program. It doesn't matter whether you're a small business of 20 people or you're a major corporation of 45,000. If the senior guy or gal is not actively involved in the change, the change runs a high probability of failure. You know, and I see it all the time, in term, even as I, with uh, friends and relatives that I work with that run small businesses. You know, they think that we can work this through in a community or a collaborative session. It doesn't take away from the responsibility of the head person. You've got to be actively involved. Second thing is uh, focus in on the customer need. If you don't have the end customer in mind and a relentless focus on that customer, you'll, you'll, you'll sub-optimize the result and you run a high probability of failure. Everything that we did in terms of the program I run, we started out is this is what the customer experience is today, this is what it needs to be in the future, and we oriented our entire program about what we wanted the attributes of the change to look like from the new customer experience. It's got to be an urgency for change. These things take a while, particularly in a large organization, and you've got to keep the focus in, in, your, in your foot on the gas pedal to deliver change and to deliver it with urgency. There's, uh, you know, particularly in our environment, there are large complex programs. It's like steering a battleship at sea. You've got to be focused on what you're doing and you've got to have drive behind what it is. And there's got to be, you know, a do or die kind of mentality because it is, as, if you think back about how many companies go out of business in, in 10 years, there's a lot of failure rate there and there's a high failure rate on change programs. 
You've got to have urgency behind what you're doing. Linkages between business and IT. IT unto itself doesn't do anything. You've got to learn. The business has to, it's got to be relevant to the business. And um, I won't go into a lot of that, but if there's a, there's a, it's important that those are linked together. You've got to look into discontinuities. And I wouldn't only say market discontinuities, but I would also say technological discontinuities. Uh, in our industry, Web 2.0, which all of you should be familiar with in terms of what you're doing, is a major disruption to business in general. And, you know, and, you, know you look at YouTube, you look at Google, those kinds of companies and the discontinuities that are created there are immense. And, uh, you know, and the barriers to entry are small in terms of what you're able to get into. And so the opportunity to get uh, marginalized in that process are significant. So you've got to look for those discontinuities in the business. In, uh, exploiting our core competencies, that's about what the, uh, the organization does well. While we weren't performing, we didn't do everything poorly. We dealt, for example, we dealt with crisis well. Anytime there was a flood, we could send out the forces and restore service quickly. You know, we did things well. We just didn't do everything very well, and we needed to elevate our game. Um, we had to, there had to be a pervasive change to a culture in terms of what we wanted to, the culture of our company to look like. We were a government entity. We were run like an administrative government entity. If you think about those things, whatever you hold in terms of that, we had to become a performance-oriented um, organization to deal in a highly competitive environment. And that requires that we've got to change our game dramatically. And then finally, we needed to be based on outcomes. Uh, telecommunications for years has been a build it and they'll come kind of mentality. If we build the network, you guys will use our service. You didn't have any choice. Um, so we were heavily internally focused in terms of networks and technologies, and we built our products and services around that. That's not outcome-based. Outcome-based is about what we're going to do to deliver a superior revenue and service kind of thing at a, at a margin that's going to deliver a return to our shareholders. So here's where we were in terms of our three years, three plus years ago when we looked at it. PSTN stands for the basic phone service in terms of what you get at your home. We had declining revenues. Uh, we were, had a slow in wireless growth. Can you imagine that in, in 2005 when wireless is taken off everywhere? Our wireless service was declining because we were getting beat by Vodafone and Optus, which is Singapore Tel. Uh, we had met very few new products, so very little new revenue coming in. We had a uh, little differentiation in our, uh, in our service, in our networks, in our products. We had a, a weak customer service is uh, a polite way of saying we had terrible customer service. We treated our customers terribly. Going down to our old world, when you call in, if you wanted to buy a, um, uh, a DSL line and a uh, fixed line, you had to deal with two separate groups. So you'd call in one group, we'd take the order, we'd transfer you over to the other group, you had to repeat all your customer details. To get that, it might take you 45 minutes to an hour on two phone calls to be able to get done with any p particular service that involved that. And then if you wanted Foxtel service for the paid TV over your DSL, it required another call. And, that, and that's what's represented in terms of those vertical stacks that were built up by network technology. There's a wireline technology on the left, a wireless in the second row, a um, DSL and AOL type service under Big Pond, and Foxtel is our... Uh, is our media programming uh, business. And each one of those were different systems, different organizations, different groups that you had to deal with. What you ought to also look at in terms of on any business side that you go through, whether it's customer care, supply chain, billing, uh, any kind of product or service that you're dealing with, any time you deal with those, those are called silos. It's the same thing. The top bar, CRM, is customer relationship management. It's all the sales and ordering. You look at that, if you look at it as a customer, there's not a streamlined flow from one end to the other to deliver an outcome for me as a customer. And those are siloed processes. And one of the major transformational things you can ever do when you find siloed processes is change those over to an integrated process, which is what we did here. See that we brought in a, uh, a new Oracle product called Siebel. Across all those four ponds, uh, piles, we've got one process, end-to-end -end process that now supports our entire customer experience in the, in the ordering and service process that we would have. So you call in once, you can order all the products and services that you're able to do. Now, that sounds simple, 
Um, this is, you know, at least in my years of running the practice in Accenture, this is the first time at scale that it's been taken on this way because of a very complicated uh, integration process within a phone company. Uh, most of the companies change it a stack at a time and try to move over. Uh, this is, uh, to do it all at once like we're doing here is a very complicated process. But, you know, it, I learned early on in my career what you look at is you look at the end customer and then you define the process end to end from an end customer perspective so you can deliver a very different kind of experience for them. And that's how we oriented the change program around here. Some of the core, these are some of the core capabilities on the left. They may not mean a lot to you, but if you, if you work with an AT&T and you get multiple bills from AT&T, we're now able to integrate those onto one bill and, at, at, uh, for all the services that you buy from us. Doesn't sound very complicated. It's a very complicated process, though. And it's fundamentally a different kind of experience where you get one bill instead of four uh, for all the products and services we get. Well, skipped over the other one. The, the, the prior slide talks about where we stand on the deployment of where we're at, and this is what's capturing a lot of the interest in the industry. Uh, we are currently have migrated over 5.3 million of our customers over. Uh, we have roughly seven that we're going to hit by the end of the calendar year, which is our full mass market. That's all the consumer base, and that's all the consumer-like products within small to medium-sized businesses. So if you run a small business, but you basically have you know, basic phone service and basic uh, broadband and, and uh, wireless service, you would be consumer-like. And uh, there's about 50% uh, uh, of our small business that have those attributes. So we'll hit 7 million by the uh, end of the calendar year. This weekend, we're migrating uh, over half a million again. On any weekend, I migrate half a million every fortnight, every two weeks. We bring a hand, roughly uh, three to 500,000 customers over. Um, additionally, in terms of the training on the business side deployment, we've had to define 600 new processes. We created training that went with that, computer-based training. I don't know if any of you have used that, but we set up an academy where we uh, have instructor-led as well as uh, CBT-type training that we can use for uh, all the people that are getting trained in our retail stores, our licensed dealers, and within the call centers and the service operations. And that's part of the delivery process that we had. We had to take all those individual stovepipes and define a common set, new set of procedures and policy with that and train our folks up on what that is as part of the uh, delivery program that we have. Uh, at this point, we've uh, trained upwards to 20,000, roughly half of our workforce, in terms of uh, that, that, have got, that are ready to use and are using the new systems in production. And so that's a massive undertaking to be able to do with frontline basically uh, customer service rep, call center people, as well as field force technicians on how to use the new stuff that we have. Within this, this is the, uh, the integrated portion of the program that I have that I'm running. Uh, normally within IT, it's the three most ripe bars that you would think that a CIO would have if, uh, if you've been exposed to that. They basically have the computer applications that they're responsible for building, supporting, running on a day-to-day -day basis. They have the people that figure out the blueprints, which is uh, the architecture, uh, that keep everything within a standard operating environment and show the roadmap of change. And then on the far right-hand side is service management or the data center operations. Uh, to give you an idea of size and scale, uh, the change program is uh, about two and a half to $3 billion over five years. On it. And that's added to the normal budget that I have every year. I run a budget of about $2 billion a year of normal run as well as, um, you know, the changes that we're delivering. It's a, a fairly sizable effort there. The strategic partner, uh, or the far left-hand side, is the business side deployment. And what that means is, is that it's where all the training, all the, you know, as you go out and you do this, you've got to upgrade all the desktops that are there with standard footprint on the software. You've got to train the folks. You've got to tell them what the new procedures are. You've got to communicate to customers what the changes are that are coming down because there's new bill formats that are coming out. They're going to see their bills that are different. They're going to see their details that are different. We're going to sign on online and look at the website to see what they're, whether they're doing it from their mobile device or from their desktop. They're going to see that in a very different way as well. And then uh, the partners that we're doing, we're dealing with 12 strategic partners through this program. 
some of which you may be interviewing with here on campus. And all these folks are involved in part of the change program that we're delivering. We're doing this in uh, four continents, 17 cities across four continents. So from a logistical side, it's a very complex logistical side effort as well. You know, and it's an interesting thing for me on this side of the fence to watch this as we deal with our traditional and non-traditional outsourcers in India, as an example, as I deal with bringing new hardware in from the States or from Europe in terms of how I pre-configure that hardware as part of the delivery process in there, and how I have to deal with uh, 12 different organizations that compete mostly every day in the marketplace and how I have to bring them together and serve the common good for us at Telstra in delivering a, a very complex program. The 17 cities would be represented over a thousand different sites in terms of where they are. And I've got over 250, 300 sites in Melbourne alone uh, in terms of uh, different floors, different buildings, in terms of what we manage as part of the delivery there. So with that, I think uh, there's a, I'm a big hockey fan, so um, you get a little Wayne Gretzky here. There's a, there's, a, there's a big part of anticipation that needs to happen in terms of these change programs that we do. Wayne Gretzky was asked, he was the most prolific goal scorer ever in the history of hockey. He was asked, how do you score so many goals? And he said, it's easy. I skate to where the puck's going to be. And, you know, it's that way true in business, too. As you look out, you've got to anticipate where you've got to take the business, what kind of changes that you want to fold in, and what you can manage. You also need to take the shots. You don't score any goals if you don't shoot. And you, you've got to be able to be willing to take the risks. You've got to be willing to take the shots to be able to deliver the outcomes that you want for your business and for your area. And, uh, you know, clearly that's uh, part of the, the game here as well. So with that, I'll stop here. And uh, Joe, Tom, I'll open it up for questions. We do ask at this time that um, everyone please stay through the remainder of the, of the program to minimize distractions. Uh, we do have some time for questions and answers. Um, as always, we ask your question to be concise, to the point, um, but you also have the opportunity to ask a follow-up question as well. Um, I'll start off with, with one first, uh, just because I'm curious about it. Um, how would you characterize the Australian consumer, because that's about, what, 85% of the, of the customer base that you guys serve? Right. It's about, in numbers, yeah. Okay. Not in services, but in numbers, yeah. How, how are they different than a U.S customer as most of us in this room would be? Well, I think culturally, uh, in Australia is probably uh, 15 to 20 years behind us culturally is the way I would characterize it. Uh, you know, the lifestyle, the pace is uh, roughly uh, what it would be like in 1980, 1985-ish kind of thing. Uh, their dependence on technology um, is, uh, is a lot different. Uh, and they're in a remote part of the world. It, you know, Australia is on the way to nothing except possibly New Zealand. Um, and um, so there's not a lot of traffic that goes through there. They're a population of 21 million people on a base of a geographic country that's the size of continental to 48 continental United States. So the United States has 15 times the population, and it has a lot more different mixes of businesses, uh, so the competitive aspects are there. They're very, um, you know, Southern California style, where they're very active, very sport-oriented. They like the beach. They like the Barbie. I mean, all that stuff is real. You know, you see the Barbie, the backyard Barbie is a real kind of deal. Uh, so is going out to the beach and everything else, so a very active lifestyle. So dealing uh, in our industry in terms of the products and services that we sell, there's, uh, there's a huge challenge in terms of their uptake on standard services. However, it is critically important for them for some of the reasons that we talked about in terms of linkaging of, of commerce on the Internet. Um, you look at a lot of remote places today, if, they're, if, they're not, if they don't have access to the global markets, um, you're left behind. Others will do it to you, will do it for you. Uh, educationally and health services-wise, these services are critically important for getting into the aboriginal population as an example and giving them basic health service and basic educational services. So the consumer adoption there has been, um, you know, different. However, it's been there because we have the highest revenue per user of any mobile service or Internet company, I think, out of the Tier 1 providers uh, 
but it's, it's very different. It's a Southern California and the culture's quite a bit um, right. slower paced. Thank you. Who would like to ask the next question? Right here. Go through the sales process when you're dealing with an Oracle and a Microsoft and a Sun Microsystems. How do you manage all those so they're not, I guess, crossing over each other's boundaries? Yeah. Everybody heard that. It's about how do we manage all those uh, strategic providers. Uh, first of all, I was their customer because I'm actually with Telstra, and so they sold in to me. Um, the benefit that we had is being here, um, you know, between Saul, his the number two guy was Greg Wynn and myself. We know the CEOs of most of all those companies. So two weeks ago, I met with Scott McNeely out at Sun. We talked about the program, but we did that up front as well. I know Bill Green at Accenture. We know Sam Palmazano at IBM. I know Joe Tucci at EMC and so on down the list. And so as it was for us to have the top leadership engaged, before we started on these programs, we had handshake deals CEO to CEO to make sure there's alignment on our mission and it didn't, uh, we did have our areas of overlaps and gaps that we needed to manage through, but we continually cycle through. There's not a month that doesn't go by that I'm not on the phone to every one of those senior executives or one of their direct reports about making sure we're doing the right thing for us. And, and there's a tremendous amount of work that goes in when you've got 8,000 people working on something across all those different locations to keep them aligned. But it goes back to that first point about having CEO engagement and leadership and I needed those for my partners. 80% of the work I do is outsourced, okay? But I, I, I own those outcomes, so I need to, to keep those folks involved and engaged. That's a good question. Next question. Over here, Colin. Hello, I was wondering, how do you maintain your professional focus in the long term considering that you go through an enormous, or enormous reorganization like you've just done. And once you've got there, I mean, you obviously don't have any time to sit back in your laurels and go, that was great. You've got to be looking for the next paradigm shift immediately. How do you maintain focus over a career when you're constantly doing that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, I was asked uh, by some of the business leaders in Australia, what, are the, what is the uh, you know, uh, most... Uh, it wasn't stupid, but, you know, a challenging uh, decision you made in the last three years. And I said, coming out of retirement to do this was probably one of the dumbest things I did. But, you know, and then taking on an ambitious program. But in all seriousness, uh, the, uh, you know, I've been doing this for 33 years. And, and uh, you know, for me, I like being in the game. Okay, I mean, you compare it to a competitive athlete. And you say, how do you... How does an athlete year on year, you know, the champions, how do they stay in the game to, or the guys that are successful in the game? How do they do that? They, they do keep their focus on, on winning and the competitive aspect to it. For me, uh, personally, um, I draw a lot of energy out of the people I work with in excitement. Uh, I'm back into this to work with the people of executives I admire deeply and uh, to work with a team that, and I like the change and to, and to form the people and, and grow them up in the process. So uh, I've done that a lot in my career. Uh, that's, you know, the people aspect of it is probably as important to me as, as anything else. And that's where the game, in my opinion, is won or lost. You have the best idea, but people execute the ideas, and if you screw that up, you, you don't get the outcome. And, uh, and, and that's probably one of the biggest learnings I had in my career early on is, uh, uh, is why do things fail? It fails because we can't execute. And how do you execute? These are complex efforts, so you've got to put a team in place. Teams work as a team. We've got to backfill each other. Not everybody can suit up and show every day. We get sick or have personal issues over the long haul. We've got to stick with it. Same thing is, is there's valleys of despairs on a long project like this. We give up holidays. We give up weekends. We give up family time to be able to deliver these kinds of outcomes. So there's something intrinsic beyond having a job and getting paid well that's going to keep people in the game. I believe that people are inspired by good leadership, good vision. And it's not just me. It's my team that's got to deliver that leadership. Um, and it's got to be adopted by the Australians because if it's just an American idea, you know, that'll wear only so long. So my, my team had to adopt it. It had to become theirs. I had to instill that in there. They had to instill that in themselves. 
and they have to take that out every day into the field. Uh, the third thing is, is that you've got to celebrate the victories along the way. We had, we had celebrations every year. Uh, the bigger celebrations are happening now that we're achieving very substantial milestones that are there. But you've got to celebrate the victories, large and small, as you go through that. It's a long haul to be able to do. Um, and you, even with very, very committed men and women, if you don't celebrate along the way, it gets pretty tiring. You know, you work 12, 15-hour days. You're working weekends overnight. When there's a problem, you've got to be there to fix it kind of deal. You've got to have some reason there that makes it fun. And people, people will do things in extraordinary ways where they believe in the outcome, they like doing it with people they like, to work with and for, and they can celebrate along the way. How you keep the focus on it is that, you know, that's my job, you know, is to make sure that, you know, I keep my team focused on the day in, day out, but I'm also looking at what's coming up on the next horizon. I do that with my planning group and making sure we're laying out the preparation for it um, in terms of getting my, you know, the next round of team players in there, infusing some new talent in, whatever those things are to keep the game fresh for them. Um, but I find at this stage in my life, three years is about all I can run on a journey. I used to be able to do five before I needed a new challenge, but it's about three for me now. And that's about where I'm at, to where I need something new and different to do. And uh, we're at a stage now where we're getting it into a routine that's, that's there. But, um, you know, the people side, people dimension of the thing is, you know, we lose sight of a lot of that. That's really where a lot of the interest and challenge for many of you will come. You know, you want to work on an interesting problem or a set of things to do, but you really want to do it with people you like and enjoy being around. And that makes a huge difference. Thank you. Yep. Next question over here. Um, I know you said you have a training academy, but is there anything else you've had to deal with with employee resistance, or have you had a lot of problems <laughs> with that? <laughs> employee resistance. Um, you know, the training academy will not deal with resistance in its own right. Um, you know, as we talked in the earlier session, people are inherently resistant to change, uh, particularly people that are, and I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, so please don't take it that way, but, you know, if I'm an hourly employee at a call center, I like the job I do, regardless of how hard it is for me to do it. Now, people generally want to do the right thing, but if you're going to change absolutely everything about my job, and, and particularly where I have incentive pay on that, it can be a challenge for me to want to take on. So there's a number of things that come through that that make change important. You know, some of our people are unionized. And so dealing with that, you know, those uh, labor issues that you may have studied in school as well are very real in terms of how you have to deal with it, how you have to work it through the union side issues if there's, if there's any there and so on. If I don't have the top support of my CEO, I'm dead. You know, because he's the one at the end of the day in my organization and all the other ones that report up to him, which are all of them, uh, that he can enforce the change or get change the people to do it. And so he's got to be bought in and um, in terms of the change program that we're about to take on. Um, we also went through uh, where, you know, there's various forms that resistance to change takes place. Uh, I presented to the board and give updates regularly to the board, but we approved our five-year program up front before we ever you know, took a shovel to the ground. And we got it funded for five years up front. And so I don't have to deal with that change dynamic that happens there where we lose heart. Money was in the bank, and we're going to go. Because it's a multi-year thing. You can't go for in-year funding and then hope to get it the next year. You know, like government programs or a lot, the way a lot of companies work. You know, most cor corporations deal with annual budgeting cycles, and programs get funded year by year. On the people side, uh, we have a lot of discussions. You first build the vision, you build the momentum around it, and then you have, you know, the non-velvet side of the hammer that comes down and deals with the tougher, tough love conversations that have to happen, and occasionally you have to replace a person. Because if a person gets in the way of the progress, there's a corporate mission, you know, change is not an option, we're changing. That's not an option. If you don't want to do that, go work somewhere else because this is the program we're taking. And again, that's a hard line because, you know, I may be a guy that the CEO loves, but if I'm resistant to change, you know, does he let his personal feelings get in the way and our professional history get in the way versus doing the right thing for the company? You know, and he should do the right thing for the company. 
in my opinion. And so you have to deal with those kinds of aspects as well. The training gives them the capability that tells them what the new job is about. Gives them the opportunity to practice on the new job. Gives the opportunity to teach them how to supervise in the new, line, new, new things that they're doing. Uh, and describes what that is for them and why it's important for our customers and those kinds of things. So the training is an enabler. No different than what you're doing here. When you go through your education here, it's equipping you to go out into the world and work. You still have to deal with all the issues that are out there in terms of whatever employer you go with. But it's prepared you to take you to a certain point to where you can now go out and work. And, that, and it, this just happens to be very specific because it shows you the screens and the process flow, how data works, how, what are the exceptions, and to handle certain types of customer interactions in a retail store or a call center and that kind of thing. But you've got to be prepared to take people out. Um, if, uh, if they're unwilling to do that. You've got to be prepared to make strong changes. You've got to break some glass along the way. And if you're not prepared to do that, then you shouldn't take on these kinds of things because they're always there on any large-scale program. I think we have time for one more question right here. Chris? Uh, you mentioned your uh, industry-leading wireless network. Can you comment on the process of developing such a network and possibly on how the U.S. lags behind in the wireless industry. Okay. Question is about our industry leading wireless network and uh, how did we get there versus, uh, and also how does it compare to what's in the United States? Um, we made a decision day one. Uh, we had three different kinds of technologies in the wireless network. And we were talking, I think, you know, about some of the mergers that have taken place here in the, net, in the U.S. as an example. I'll use this as a sidelight. When I was running the, the global <coughs> comms practice, uh, I looked at what the merger synergies were going to be across the uh, 12 plus wireless companies in, the United, in North America. And what I came down to is looking at network technologies and where the synergies were. So for example, uh, T-Mobile, AT&T Wireless, and Singular all had the same basic network technology and direction that they were going with. Sprint has a stalled network technology called CDMA. Um, Nextel is on the Motorola uh, and radio network which is a separate technology, not compatible with CDMA, not compatible with what Singular and others were doing. And so from a merger synergy point of view, combining those two together was a failed deal at the beginning, and they, they overpaid, in my opinion. And I did never understood the transaction at the beginning. Huge capital outlay to fix that problem, and if they didn't bake that into the deal, they, they have the fundamental economics of the deal wrong. We, st we had three wireless technologies, one of which was CDMA. And uh, we decided to go with the 850 megahertz uh, Ericsson network, which is the same as AT&T Wireless here. And we uh, built out and deployed that nationwide in 10 months, which nobody has ever done uh, at that size and scale. And, uh, and it originally was at uh, 3.6. We brought it to 7.2, 14.4 since we deployed it and unveiled it in October of 06. Uh, it was done on a built-in, that was done on a strategic basis. You know, I've commented earlier, I think, uh, not in this session, but in another one. You know, my experience, companies do things for one of three or a combination of three reasons. They do it to grow revenue. They do it to grow, reduce cost. They do it to improve service. Rarely have I seen where we do something on a strategic base where there's major money. We talk about it, but when you get down to it, they want to know where the return is on the P&L statement, and they want to know what it's going to do for the shareholders. And it's one of those three things that happen. Every project I've ever sold has had that in it. And if I've ever tried to sell this stuff on strategy, it doesn't go because they want to know where the other three elements are. So this one, we knew there would be a revenue and a customer experience differentiation if we could deploy the best wireless network in the world. We also knew that if we deployed the wireless network and didn't connect it right through the long haul network or long distance network so that it had similar capacity or greater than what the wireless network provided, it would diminish the service because if it was choked off on the long distance, you're trying to stream video from Sydney to Melbourne, and it's choked by the long distance, there'll be latency in it, and it'll break up the image as it goes through on a streaming. That's what happened. And you'll look at this and you say, why do I want this service? So it's got to be able, it's got to have big enough pipes to take all that stuff down at the, and throttle it throughout to the network. So we did that on a strategic basis there. Why is that important? AT&T has the same network technology. They have the same Ericsson switches out there, and they're throttling back their service because they don't have the interconnectivity on a long-haul basis. 
It'll chew up the capacity of their network if they try to replicate what we're doing at 3.6 going to 7.2 if they can do that. And, and it's just the reality of it. So how do they compare or how does Verizon compare to what we do? You, you know, I find that there's a greater latency in the network. I find that uh, there's services that I, would, uh, that I have come to use. And I'm not a, I don't watch a lot of TV on my mobile phone. You know, I just don't do that. But occasionally I will when I'm waiting to watch the news or something. But, there, you know, there's downloads. I can download like this on my wireless down to, to my BlackBerry or my iPhone. Download like that, fat file. I can stream video in if I want to do that. Get all my mail synchronized, et cetera. That takes me a lot, the latency is a lot different here. I also have access to other services in Australia that I don't have here, some of which you may not care about. Uh, Domino's, we have uh, in certain cities with certain Domino's pizzas, as an example, we have location-based services uh, where uh, I'll get an advertisement. You know, if I'm walking by Domino's here, it'll shoot me a coupon to go in and buy a pizza at that store, you know, if I'm so inclined to want to do that. Uh, it also has a deal where it's, uh, I can search and find where you are if you're on my buddy and you allow me access to it. I can uh, search on the network and know where you are based on where your mobile phone is. You know, and I see you're down the street at Joe's Bar or, uh, or the shack when it used to be here and we can go meet up there. Um, and it, likewise, I can do that with my kids where they don't get the opportunity to do that. So wherever my kids are with their phone, and some of you may not like that, but, uh, you know, and I don't use it with my daughter that's there, but I could, be, if I wanted to, I could do that. We got a concierge service where I can dial 1234 and go into our directory business. And I want to say, I want to know where the nearest Italian restaurant is. They know where I'm at, shows what cross section street I'm at. And they say the nearest three here are here. Or if I want to go in and, you know, go to a pharmacy or go to a such and such retailer. You know, those services don't exist here. You know, they're capable of existing here, but it requires applications and bandwidth to be able to provide that. I met with an executive from Disney in, in early 2000, and this is about talking about interactive uh, video on demand, if you know what that is. Basically says, I want to watch, you know, uh, uh, the James Bond movie, uh, you know, the one that uh, um, Daniel Craig, the last one that he came out with. I want to see that one, and I want to download it on demand. You know, that service exists somewhere. And, the, and those trials have been going on for 20 years here, 15, 20 years here. The first one was done in Orlando in the early 90s, uh, being able to do that, where those were electronically. They couldn't build out the networks economically. Um, but I was going through with them, and we were talking, and he said, we're going to get this up and running. And I said, how are you going to deliver it to the homes? Because the high-speed networks didn't exist at scale around the country to be able to do that. Those exist largely today, to be able to at least download movies and in fact, content files that in most major and second tier markets today. But the major difference in the wireless network is the speed, the quality of the network, the greatest service, and the kinds of things and applications and services that we're building, of which I gave you a few examples there. Uh, those don't exist here in the U.S. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, before everyone leaves, I want to say a few words of thanks. Number one to uh, Tom O'Neill and the uh, advancement group. Uh, would you guys just stand up very quickly? Thank you for your assistance in helping us put this together. Um, second, Tina Balser from, my, from the uh, MBA office. Thank you for your help. And, and I'd, like, uh, I'd like Mr. Lamming to uh, join me really quickly to, so we can show you um, some appreciation here. From the True Last College of Business, University of Missouri and appreciation to Thomas Lamming, Distinguished Alumni Lecture, October 9th, 2008. We really appreciate your time and effort to come Thanks, here today. Joe. Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you. And, and perhaps more valuable than that, uh, we have some black and gold here for you to, for your 20-hour uh, flight back to Sydney on Friday night. <laughs> He's going to have to miss the, the game on Saturday, oh, but he uh, should be home in time to be able to watch that. So. Oh. Thank you. There you go. All right. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks.